Hi friends, and welcome to another lesson in the Network Address Translation Operations and Concepts module. In this lesson, we'll be discussing dynamic PAT. So if we pull up our definitions from the NAT terminology lesson, we know that a dynamic translation is one where the translation device chooses the post translation attributes, and we know that a PAT is one where we're making a modification to the layer three and the layer four header. If we combine those terms, we get a definition for a dynamic PAT as one where the administrator defines the pre-translation attributes and the post-translation attributes, but the device actually decides the mapping between the pre-translation IP address import and the post-translation IP address import. Let's show you how that works. Here we have a topology with three hosts on the inside, a couple hosts on the outside, and then a router as our network address translation device. A dynamic PAT configuration would look like this. We would tell our router that, hey, the IP address is 1066.0 slash 24, aka the entire inside segment, is going to share the IP address 328266. Now, some of you might notice there are no ports in our configuration, right? But that's weird though, right? Because we said that this would be a PAT. Well, the ports are going to come into play in a moment, even though they aren't specified in the configuration. What this will do, what this configuration will do, is it'll make it so that all these hosts, as they speak out to the internet, will all share this one IP address. The router will keep track of the translations it made in a translation table. This table is going to just include what the router has translated. This isn't a part of the actual configuration. So this is internal to how the router is working and performing the dynamic pat. So let's give you some examples. When host A shoots out a packet, it's going to come from a source IP address of 106661, a source port of 2222. When this packet hits the router, the router will see that it matches our dynamic PAT configuration and modify the source IP address from 106661 to the shared IP address of 328266 and the source port from 2222 to 7777. Hence, we're changing IP addresses and port Hence, this indeed is a PAT. On the other side of the router, this packet would look like this. Notice the only thing that changed is the source, and in the source we changed both the IP address and the port. When host B shoots out a packet, its source IP address would be 106662. It's going to use a source port of 3333. This will match our dynamic PAT configuration, and our router will translate the source of 106662 port 3333 to the shared IP address of 328266 and a new port of 8888. On the other side of the router, this is what that packet would look like. Now let's pause here for a quick second and talk about these source ports. This request was made to port 443, so we can presume that this is an HTTPS request, a secure web request. This request was made to port 80, so we can presume that this is an HTTP request, a regular web request. When you're making a well-known port request in, for web or HTTPS or FTP or whatever else, your, the application is determining the destination port. That's where this 80 and this 443 are coming by the actual application making these connection attempts. These source ports are actually randomly selected by the hosts themselves. So host A randomly selected port 2222, and host B randomly selected port 3333. Now the range of port numbers that these hosts can use to randomly select ports from gives about 65,000 possible ports, which means, though unlikely, it is not entirely unheard of for two hosts to randomly choose the same source port. It's definitely not common, but it's also not overly rare either. These hosts do not communicate with, it, with each other to coordinate which source ports they are using. They simply pick one randomly, locally, and send the packet out. So host C, in this example, sends out a packet from its own IP address and randomly selects the source port of 3333. When that packet hits the router, the router is going to translate it to the shared IP address according to the configuration, and the router is going to pick a new source port of 9999. On the other side of the translation, this is what that packet would look like. So this covers showing you the outbound packet 
of a connection that was initiated by the internal hosts. Let's show you the response traffic coming back from those initial packets. So in this first server, response to host A, it's going to respond to the IP address 32.8.266, port 77. That'll match this entry in the router's translation table, and the router will know, oh, this packet needs to be untranslated to host A's IP address on port 2222, and that's what'll allow the router to untranslate that packet correctly. When the next response packet comes back, it'll arrive on port 8888. The router will match that to this translation entry, which tells the router that this particular packet should be delivered to host B. And when the packet comes in on port 9999, the router will know that that should be untranslated to host C's IP address and port 3333. So that takes care of illustrating the entire packet flow of a dynamic pad. At this point, I want to go back and looking at the outbound packet and answer a specific question. That question is why was the source port re-randomized? Notice here, host A, host B, and host C chose randomly port 222, 333, and 333. And on the outside, the router re-randomized those ports to 777, 888, 999. The question is, why did this happen? Well, let me show you what would happen if that wasn't the case, if the ports were not re-randomized. Let's say host A chose 222 and kept 2222. Host B chose 3333 and kept 3333, and same thing for host C. On the outbound side of things, this is the mapping that would exist for all the outbound pappings. The interesting thing is what would happen on the way back in. When this first server responds, it's going to respond to 328266 port 2222. The router will then match that against this translation entry, and that's what's going to tell the router that this particular packet should be untranslated to host A. But when the next packet comes back, it'll be destined to port 3333. And you'll notice the router has two entries for port 3333 which means the router has no way to tell whether this packet should be untranslated to host B or to host C. Moreover, when the third packet comes back, it'll be the same thing. It'll also be destined to port 333. And again, the router has two entries in its translation table, and therefore the router is not going to know whether host B should get that packet or host C should get that packet. If you think about it, this packet looks identical to this packet insofar as it's layer three and layer four information. This is why the source port was re-randomized because it assures that on the outbound side, we always have unique IP addresses and ports. And this ensures that when the response packets comes back, the router can successfully untranslate back that packet back to the original host, which sent out the initial communication. That is why the source port was re-randomized. Now this usually leads to another important question. The next important question is, what happens if the traffic was initiated by the outside host? So let's illustrate that. Let's say we have host C shooting out a packet to the shared IP address 32.8.266 and port 443. Now we know anything sent to the shared IP address will get routed to our router. So this packet initiated by the outside host will definitely get, will definitely arrive on our router. When it arrives, the router is going to look in its translation table for an entry that matches 443. And you'll notice there is no present entry for it. As such, the router has no choice but to drop that packet. Remember, this IP address is being shared by host A and host B and host C. If this packet arrives, even though it'll arrive to the router, the router has no way of determining whether this should be delivered to host A or to host B or to host C, or technically to any of the 250 or so possible hosts that are sharing that IP address. The only reason these packets made it back through the router is because these packets had an entry in the translation table which told the router which host should receive the untranslated packet. 
And the only reason these entries existed is because both of these packets are responses to packets that were initially sent out by our internal hosts. The key takeaway here is that a dynamic PAT is a unidirectional translation. For traffic to flow, the traffic must be initiated from the inside. Anything initiated from the outside will always be dropped. Keep in mind, this isn't a feature of dynamic PAT. It is simply a byproduct of the fact that we are sharing an IP address and re-randomizing these ports. So this is an important point about dynamic PAT. Now, if you happen to actually want this packet to come back through, you do have the ability to combine a dynamic PAT with a static PAT, in which case you would tell the router which host should get this packet by creating a static PAT that says, hey, this IP address and port will always map to this IP address and port. If you configure that static PAT, then this then our router will know how to deliver this packet, in our example, back to host C. So you do have the option of combining a static PAT with a dynamic PAT to allow a specific port back through our unidirectional translation. This is an example of what's called hole punching. And if you do any sort of online gaming or anything like that, and you had to set up a port forwarding or a port triggering or anything like that on your home Wi-Fi router, that is exactly what you are doing. Your home Wi-Fi router is doing a dynamic PAT, and you created a static PAT to allow a specific packet back through. All right, so that was a lot of information about dynamic PAT. Let's wrap this up by identifying a few last pieces of information about dynamic PAT. A dynamic PAT allows many hosts, many private IPs, to share one public IP address. This is sometimes referred to as a many-to-one or a one-to-many translation, the idea being all 250 or so of these IP addresses are all sharing one IP address. A dynamic PAT actually creates the greatest potential for IP address conservation. In this particular illustration, we have 250 potential IP addresses sharing one IP address on the outside. Dynamic PAT is actually what the creators of NAT had in mind when they are using it as a solution to conserve IPv4 address space. For a device to do dynamic PAT, it must assure unique source ports on the outside. We talked about that is what allows the return traffic to be successfully mapped back to the initiating host. This fact limits the amount of concurrent connections that can exist for every shared IP address to the amount of ports that exist, which means every shared IP address in a dynamic PAT gives you about 65,000 concurrent connections. If you happen to be in an environment which needs more than 65,000 concurrent connections, you can simply add more public IP addresses to your dynamic PAT pool. This dot 66 IP address has given us 65,000 concurrent connections. And if I wanted to double that, I could simply add another IP address to my dynamic PAT pool. And now these two IP addresses are giving us two sets of 65,000 concurrent connections. So about 130,000 concurrent connections through this device. And finally, very key important point that I want to make sure that we highlight is that a dynamic PAT is a unidirectional translation for traffic to flow. The internal host must initiate that traffic. If you wanted to allow a specific port back through a dynamic PAT, you can combine a dynamic PAT with a static PAT. This allows a specific internal port to be accessed externally. So that covers the lesson on dynamic PAT. And this is our summary slide highlighting the important points. Here was the definition we used for a dynamic PAT. It is a translation in which the device is determining the final IP address and port. This provides the greatest ability for address conservation by allowing many private IP addresses to share one or at least far fewer public IP addresses. The translation device must ensure unique IP address and port combinations on the outside, which means every IP address you use as your shared public IP addresses gives you about 65,000 possible concurrent connections. And finally, a dynamic PAT is unidirectional, meaning traffic will only flow if it was initiated internally.
So that wraps up our lesson on dynamic pat. I hope you enjoyed this lesson, and I'll thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey YouTube, want to learn more? Check out the rest of the free network address translation videos. Then, when you're ready to take it a step further, check out these courses which teach you how to configure, verify, and troubleshoot NAT on Cisco routers and firewalls. As always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.